Hello, this is Tony Heller from RealClimateScience.com, setting the record straight about science. In this video, we're going to be looking at how to identify herd immunity. This graph shows COVID-19 deaths per million at each of the 50 United States. The two deadliest states are New Jersey and New York, with more than 1,500 deaths per million. I've annotated the graph with Democratic states in blue and Republican states in red. There isn't any strict definition of blue states and red states. For example, Maryland is only 35% Republican, but they have a Republican governor. But the definitions I've used for blue states and red states are generally fairly accurate. It's pretty easy to see that generally Democratic-controlled states have much higher death rates than Republican-controlled states. The average deaths per million among Democratic-controlled states is 540, compared to 201 for Republican states. So people in Democratic states are more than two and a half times as likely to die from COVID-19 than people in Republican states. This next graph shows yesterday's daily percent change in total COVID-19 cases for each state. These states are in the same order along the x-axis as they were on the previous graph. But the previous graph decreased from left to right. This graph generally increases from left to right. What this graph shows us is that states with lower death rates on the right side of the graph are seeing a larger increase in the number of cases right now. So in this next graph, I plotted deaths per million population along the x-axis and percent change in total cases along the y-axis. This graph shows very clearly that states with higher deaths per million are seeing much smaller increases in the total number of cases. This would imply that states with higher deaths per million are close to herd immunity. They're not seeing a lot of new cases. Whereas many states with lower death rates are seeing a much larger increase in the total number of cases. From this graph, it appears that herd immunity occurs somewhere around 500 deaths per million. So it looks like the virus generally kills about 0.05% of the population. Put another way, the virus does not appear to kill 99.95% of people. Now let's take a larger look at the world at the countries with the 10 highest COVID-19 death rates. San Marino, Belgium, Andorra, the UK, Spain, Italy, and Sweden are all above 500 deaths per million and France, USA, and Peru are a little bit below that number. Now we're going to look at the daily death graphs for each of these 10 countries moving from left to right. San Marino appears to have achieved herd immunity. They haven't had any deaths in almost two months. Belgium, with the second highest death rate in the world, also appears to have achieved herd immunity. Belgium has seen very few deaths over the past month. It's the same story with Andorra and the United Kingdom appears to be rapidly closing in on herd immunity. After a huge spike in deaths in early April, Spain appears to have achieved herd immunity. And the same story with Italy. Sweden also appears to be very close to herd immunity, although their path to getting there was much less painful than that of the other countries. Sweden never closed their borders, they never closed their under-16 schools, they never closed their bars and their restaurants, and they did everything they could to avoid trampling on human rights. Sweden took an approach based on science and human rights, and they did much less damage to their economy in the process. Very few other countries took the common sense approach which Sweden took. Now let's look at the other countries under 500 deaths per million, like France. They're just under 500, and it appears that they have achieved herd immunity. The United States is also headed towards herd immunity, although we've had a setback recently, which I'll be discussing in a minute. Peru is number 10 in the list. They appear to still be quite a ways away from herd immunity. So let's look at what happened in the United States recently, specifically in Texas. On April 29th, Elon Musk congratulated Texas for their plans to reopen on May 1st. This graph shows the number of daily new COVID-19 hospitalizations at the Texas Medical Center. Texas reopened on May 1st and they're doing just fine during the month of May. But Texas ran into a problem at the end of May. George Floyd, the man who was killed by Minneapolis police, was from Houston. So massive crowds of people gathered in Houston and held large protests for almost three weeks. This led to a huge spike in the number of cases in Texas, 
which began a few days after the protests began. This is a picture of one of those protests for Black Trans Lives Matter. You can see there's a lot of people packed into a very small space. So these people are all breathing each other's germs, and as they march along, they're breathing the germs of everyone who marched ahead of them. These aerosol droplets can stay in the air for 20 minutes. It's difficult to imagine how you could do anything more foolish than a large protest march during a viral epidemic. Here's an article from the Houston Chronicle. Tens of thousands march on downtown Houston to memorialize George Floyd. So the same newspapers which a couple days earlier were telling people to stay home, don't go to work, don't go to school, don't go to church, don't go to the gym, don't do anything, all of a sudden they're bragging about huge crowds of people gathering in downtown Houston. A lot of these protesters were wearing masks and carrying signs saying, I can't breathe. And for some of them, that sign was prophetic. After they contracted the virus, they were having a very difficult time breathing. These people imagined that because they had a piece of cloth over their mouth, they would be safe from the virus, even though many years of medical research shows that that is simply not the case. And the same public health officials who were telling everybody to stay home for the previous two months, all of a sudden they were condoning these massive protests and demonstrations. The parody site Babylon B created a fake COVID-19 Twitter account. In solidarity with those protesting inequality, I hereby vow not to infect anyone at BLM rallies. Dr. Fauci has no problem telling people not to go to Trump rallies, but he never said a word about people not going to BLM rallies. There's pretty strong circumstantial evidence that the BLM protests did lead to a huge spike in infections. This didn't occur after the state reopened, it happened after the rallies. Let's take a look now at how the press reported on this. They did what they normally do, and they simply lied about it. The Economist said, Researchers found that the Black Lives Matter protests in America had no significant effect on the incidence of COVID-19. Anyone with basic graph reading skills can see that The Economist is lying. And the Los Angeles Times told the same lie. Experts see little evidence that protests spread coronavirus. It's pretty clear that the protests probably did spread coronavirus, and there was never any reason to believe that they wouldn't. Packing a huge number of people into a small space like that was certainly likely to lead to problems. In a lot of states like Florida, doctors were specifically directed not to ask sick people if they were at the protests. They said this was a violation of their rights. So apparently government can lock people up in their homes, force them out of work, shut their businesses down, refuse to allow them to go to church, but they can't ask people if they attended a rally and spread disease. And if the doctors were not allowed to ask if people were at the protests, how could these experts possibly have determined that the protests did not spread coronavirus? The information needed to make that determination would not have been available. Now let's look at a couple more critical pieces of information from the Center for Disease Control. This graph shows which ethnic groups are most likely to end up in the hospital with COVID-19. Native Americans are the highest risk group, followed closely by Blacks and Hispanics. Asians and white people have much lower risk of ending up in the hospital. Now let's look at CDC's data for hospitalization based on age. Children are very unlikely to end up in the hospital. People under 50 are also generally at pretty low risk. But as people get older, their risk gets higher, particularly over 85 years old. So we can infer from the two graphs, which we've just seen, that most of the people who end up in the hospital are older Hispanics, Blacks, and Native Americans. It would appear that young healthy Asians and young healthy white people are at relatively low risk from the virus. This would explain why Asian countries have had very low death rates. It appears that Asians are generally not very susceptible to the virus. So Asian countries probably don't need to get up to 500 deaths per million in order to achieve herd immunity. And in reality, probably nobody actually needed to get up to 500 deaths per million in order to achieve herd immunity. The smart thing for a country to have done would have been to isolate their population at risk and get their low-risk population to herd immunity as quickly as possible. In doing so, they would have minimized economic devastation and also minimized loss of life. There was probably never any need for any country to get up to 500 deaths per million. 
Had Sweden done a better job protecting their older people, they could have achieved herd immunity with a smaller loss of life. The massive carnage which occurred in many blue states most certainly should have been avoided. This was largely due to governors sending sick people into nursing homes. That was probably the most anti-science, anti-human thing they could have done. What's gone on in the United States for the past four months appears to be completely irrational and incoherent. It's difficult for me to believe that these public health officials advocating these huge protests at a critical time was not nefarious behavior. Now we've got a big spike in cases and the public health officials who are responsible for it are blaming President Trump. The whole thing reeks of politics. Toto doesn't like it when people act like sheep and he's been seeing a lot of that behavior over the last few months. Visit him on the web at realclimatescience.com. He's been pulling back the curtain on junk science and propaganda for a long time.